Hi, Priscilla. Hello, Dr. Chanel. I'm very excited to discuss the book Rosewater by Liv Little. My name is Priscilla Adjaman. I'm the founder of Sadie Baddies, a virtual sanctuary designed for Black and multiracial people to come together in community and remove the stigma surrounding mental health. And I'm also the host of the Soft Life podcast, which shares weekly episodes about dealing with mental health and our lived experiences as Black and multiracial people. And we have amazing guests like Dr. Chanel yourself, um, you're one of our favorite <laughs> guests on the show. And yeah, really excited to be here. Awesome. I'm so excited to be here with you. I love your podcast and I'm obsessed with Sadie Baddies, the community you've created. My name is Dr. Chanel Ram Subic. I am an adult psychiatrist as well as a child and adolescent psychiatrist. And I'm currently working and living in Oakland, California. I am a second generation Trinidadian Canadian. And I've spent the majority of my career working in black and brown communities that have been historically underrepresented. I also use my social media at Dr. Chanel MD to also discuss topics around reducing the stigma around mental health in our community and also topics that are very specific to mental health within the black community. And actually my work on social media is what led me to develop a relationship with you, Priscilla. Yes, and I love that. I love how organic our relationship has been and how we found each other through the internet. And I think it really speaks to the larger movement of collective healing that we're all on this journey on together. Um, exactly. So let's dive into Rosewater. And so for those of you who don't know, Rosewater by Liv Little right here is a coming of age novel. And the main character, her name is Elsie and she's an aspiring poet in London. And Elsie is kind of going through this turmoil, this, I guess you can say quarter life crisis, um, going through this journey and unlearning so many aspects about herself, her identity, and it's really about intergenerational healing and um, family dynamics, as well as opening up to the possibility of love. So love this book. I think that um, one of the things that struck me the most is how the family relationship and family dynamics affect us on such a deep level. What about you, Dr. Shannon? Agreed. I really loved how in this book, they did a really deep exploration of how family relationships can affect us. Um, I think that in my work as a psychiatrist, I recognize that our primary relationships are our family. And so they have a huge impact on how we um, understand ourselves in the world and also how we might interact with other people later in life outside of that family unit. And really there's a passage where Elsie breaks down to her friend Maggie about right. her parents yeah. and how their absence and judgment has kind of closed her off to love. Yeah. Yeah, I think that passage in particular really, it was jarring and it was so raw and honest. And I think more of us have had those conversations with people that we love or people that we trust where we're trying to explain how we feel and our experiences with our family, how they've hurt us, you know, how much we resent them. And I think that's what Elsie's struggling with in this moment. She's struggling with that resentment that built up anger and frustration. And she is really yearning to get over this, this setback and this challenge in building a healthy relationship with her, her parents and her family. So I really, I feel that and I think despite where you or someone might be right now in their family dynamic we've all had at some point a moment where we're like you know at our wits end with our family or our loved yes. ones and we just want them to see us and to realize how they've also contributed to some of the issues that we right. might have developed as an adult but love for you to speak more about that journey i know we've talked about it on the podcast how yes. Yes, <laughs> childhood development and our family dynamics have a, such a major impact, if not the most impact on our livelihood as mm -hmm. adults. But I'd love for you to, you know, touch on that and your, your knowledge. Yeah, of course. I think that it was so interesting how um, Elsie figured it out. She recognized this pattern in her life, this pattern that she's been closed off to love. 
And then there's like this, this, um, this part of her that starts to do some discovery. Like, where does this come from? And what she concluded was there was probably um, some impact of her parents' relation, of her parents' dynamic or her family dynamic that led her to be closed off to love. And I think that the natural thing is to have some anger because our parents or our families, we put them in this very small, this category that um, you know, they're not supposed to hurt us because they're their family. They're supposed to be perfect. We put them on this, I think sometimes a pedestal, right? Mm -hmm. We have this yeah. anger towards them. Yes. One thing that you and I have talked about being um, a second generation immigrants. Yes, yes. A very common theme with our first generation immigrant parents is this scarcity mindset that there are a finite amount of resources, we need to be successful. The alternative to that is so dire, you need to be successful. And this creates this scarcity mindset in their second generation no, children. And then mm -hmm. as we are navigating life, we recognize that scarcity mindset is not helping us at all. In nope. fact, we <laughs> need to have the abundance mindset. And I think that, um, I, when I started to recognize that in myself, I did get mad at my parent, my family as well. Yeah. I don't know if you felt that same yes. way. Yes. I mean, I literally, I, I can't relate any more than what you <laughs> shared. Like, I feel it so deeply. I think also there's an aspect of, of um, especially financial health and financial uh, habits that we get passed down, you know, from our parents and from our family members. And one thing that sticks out, and when you mention scarcity mindset, I naturally do start to think of financial health, but I think scarcity comes in a lot of different ways. Scarcity with love, scarcity with opportunities and health, so many other things. But I think for a lot of us, especially those who come from black and multiracial families, um, I am Ghanaian and my parents were born and raised in Ghana. They moved here in the 90s and started a brand new life. You know, my, my dad, worked as, um, as an IT slash uh, system uh, software engineer and worked his way through corporate essentially. And he learned so much. He had to assimilate to the culture of America. And my mom started her own business, um, you know, 10 years being in America. And that provided us so many opportunities, but it's it's it does show you that what they had to deal with in their starting point is so different than mine, you know? Like my first job was um, right out of grad school and I was working at a nonprofit, you know? That, that was challenging for me because I was learning so much, but at the same time, it's nothing in comparison to my, my parents and what they had to go through. So we each had our own scarcity mindset I think, you know, growing mm -hmm. up and being in your early 20s, by the time I, my mom was 27, she'd already had me. And when I was 27, I'm still trying to figure out life. <laughs> so I completely know. different realities, you know, but I think- My parents were 23. Oh my God. So, and that's like so, doesn't it feel so young? Like in retrospect, so how did you manage to do young. that? And come to a new country and- you know, I mean, well, it shows I, they played by different rules than us. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, I think a lot of us, we've seen our parents struggle with, you know, their finances, um, especially if they didn't have a really a head start or, or a lot of resources mm -hmm. to get themselves as assimilated and comfortable as they could have been. And that creates that fear that we have with our finances and money and creating wealth for ourselves. And I feel like one of the biggest components of generational healing is also building generational wealth. And you yeah. know, how do we do that? How do we start? For me, I think community care is one of the most essential parts of that, you know, versus mm -hmm. just, okay, everyone get an LLC, start a business. That's great. <laughs> but there's a lot of folks who are not going to come to that point. How can we how do you think that we can incorporate community care so that it aligns with all of us being able to build generational wealth 
and health for our families down the line. Yeah, and I think that one huge component of that is your mindset. And scarcity mindset does not allow you to come together in community because one of the bases of scarcity mindset is the fact that resources are finite and that not everybody can grow and win together. And I think that this scarcity mindset is a, um, a trauma response that our parents had being immigrants to the country and having that type of responsibility to provide for the family and also their children. And you know what I'm recognizing? Liv Little is actually Jamaican and Chinese right. descent yes. in South yep. London. Yes. Uh, yep. And I think that this scarcity mindset trauma is so common amongst us. Um, um Black uh, children of the diaspora. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And a part of the healing process of healing that scarcity mindset is recognizing that our parents are human and they needed to do things to survive. And what they needed to survive is not what we need to survive. And so we can live in that like like lc was doing it is okay to be angry that certain family dynamics have affected you now but you have the responsibility i think to also heal yeah right absolutely it's like the saying you know your trauma is not your fault but your healing is your responsibility Mm -hmm. and I think when we hear that, sometimes we can feel, well, I don't, this isn't my fault. I shouldn't have to do all of this work myself. And it's true. Healing's not supposed to be done alone. It's yeah. supposed to be done in community. It's supposed exactly. to be done collectively. So I yeah. think that, um, you know, reading Rosewater and even the first chapter with Elsie getting evicted and <laughs> her being terrified and and trying to remember some of those like self-healing self self-care practices with taking deep breaths and you know um there's a quote or a passage in it that says in that moment she's trying to call on on all of these self-care tools or these these healing modalities and she's not able to because she's so confronted with this fear of of being evicted um yeah you know and i think that's the reality for a lot of people is that sometimes in the moment you may not be able to um, remember, okay, what do I need to do in this moment? What do I need to to do so that I can get myself out of this situation? But I think her eventually leaving and, and living with her best friend, Juliet, I think really shows the importance of having those relationships. And that yeah. is community care in itself, you know, being yeah. able and willing to give someone a safe space while they unpack, while they are able to do that. And then if that's in your capacity to, of course, you know, there's other ways that you can help and and contribute to um, someone having a safe space, whether it's literally, figuratively, you know, physically. So um, I think it really speaks to a lot of our internal struggles with trying to find a space to unpack our trauma, our our childhood moments that kind of resurface mm-hmm. at the most inconvenient times. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> right? that, like yeah. when you're trying to find love. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I think, yeah, I think that love is such a complicated, um, it's such a complicated um, feeling. It's such a complicated mm-hmm. thing because what, where do you, what you don't, that's where you look to f- really understand love is your primary relationship is your family and usually love is extremely complicated within families yeah you know um also what you were saying about in the first chapter when she gets um you know with that possibility of being evicted i remember this concept that black men get locked up and black women get locked out And so it's this idea that there are all these, like the impact of racism is constantly breaking up the black community in all these different ways. And building community within us is actually an act of resistance because laws are trying to break up our community. And so I love that within the first chapter, you already see that there is Elsie who is 
you know, she can't use any of her coping skills because yeah. coping skills are really supposed to be used when things are mild or exactly. coping skills are supposed to be really used to keep you out of going into, you know, right. a crisis mode. But when you're in crisis, deep breathing, it's its really hard for that to, to work, particularly the crisis of, of having unstable housing. Yeah. You can't breathe, breath work your, outside, your way out of being on the street. Yeah. Um, and these are the real problems that we face because of racism, sexism, homophobia. And so that's why community is literally an act of resistance to all of those oppressive structures. And so I love that in this book, we already get straight into it. It brings yeah. people like you and I, making us feel like the things that we deal with are important. Yes, you know? absolutely. Yeah, I, I, that is so true. I think, you know, looking at it from a framework of not only this is something that's just happening to LC, this is just an, an isolated incident. This is something that happens every single day in London, in New York, in LA, <laughs> exactly everywhere, everywhere. Yeah. Right. So I, I really appreciate you shedding light on that and, and, you know, highlighting that aspect of this being a perpetual um, systemic issue. That's not just one person missing rent for a month or two. This is, you know, a collective issue where this is breaking up a family. This is breaking up a home. And, you know, to Elsie, this was one of the first places that started to feel like home. And, you know, losing that sense of home, I think, it's it's not ironic that she's losing her physical home, but also trying to find her way back to her her familial home as well. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. I definitely encourage anyone to check out this book. It is such a good read. It's amazing. It's really 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 such a, a, a beautiful you know novel of intergener intergenerational healing, um, love, family. And let's share where people can find us, Dr. Chanel. I think we definitely should. Um, so you can find me on my social media page called Dr. Chanel MD on Instagram. You can message me. I am very responsive and would love to continue this conversation um, through my social media channels as well. Yes, definitely give her a follow. She is your favorite psychiatrist, the coolest <laughs> psychiatrist I've ever seen, truly. Um, and yes, you're, you're going to love going on your journey because you're also sharing like parts of your journey as well and like your learnings, um, which I think is just so beautiful and refreshing. And I think, you know, sometimes um, in the medical field, it can feel very like stoic or it can feel oh, very sterile. Yeah. Yes, exactly. But I think yeah. you can, you're the opposite of that <laughs> while still providing so much information and resources. Yeah. You always share resources, which I love and appreciate yeah. um, so much. And you can find me, Priscilla O. Adjuman, on my personal Instagram, um, Priscilla.o.adjuman, or also, of course, follow Sadie Betty's, um, Sadie underscore my Betty. Favorite. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> on all platforms instagram tiktok youtube twitter uh we have we exist on all of the social media platforms as well as the soft life pod um which you can follow on instagram and of course you know subscribe on apple or spotify wherever you listen to podcasts so Thank you so much for Thank taking you so in. much. This was so great. I'm yes. so happy that we got to speak on one of our favorite topics and that it was covered in this amazing book by Liv Little. Yes, definitely check it out. <laughs>